Now, COBE was the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite. It uh, is shown in schematic form on the left-hand side. It was a smallish satellite where uh, some solar panels picked up the radiation, the wings that you see around the body of the satellite. There was a shield to make sure that the instruments didn't see the things they shouldn't. And mounted within the shield were really two key instruments and a third that I won't talk about. The two key instruments I want to talk about are the differential microwave radiometer, the DMR, shown in the center panel, and the FIRAS, the Far Infrared Absolute Spectrometer. Now the DMR, as the name implies, is a differential radiometer. It looks at the sky in two directions, through, through two ports, which you can see on the upper part of the body of the instrument, and compares their brightness in a differential radiometer. The FIRAS instrument is a long horn, uh, coloured black in the right-hand picture, which works in much the same way as the Crawford Hill horn did that Penzias and Wilson worked with. But rather than being uh, sort of 80 feet across, this thing was only about a metre long and had a small gap at the front for the radiation to get in. And that uh, front could be covered by a uh, very well calibrated black body radiator, which they slammed into the top of the horn from time to time to check on how much signal was being seen by the spectrometer. OK, so what did they find? FIRAS was able to measure the spectrum of the background radiation in about 15 minutes. And very shortly after the satellite was turned on, it made its critical measurement. <clears throat> and that's shown here. There are two lines on this graph. One is the uh, thermal spectrum of uh, that corresponds to 2.73 Kelvin, that's shown in blue. And then the Kobe fire ass points with their error bars are shown in white. You can't see the Kobe points with their error bars because they vanish under the blue line to make the blue line visible. That is, the spectrum looks like a thermal spectrum to extraordinarily high precision. The microwave background radiation really is of extraordinarily thermal nature. The peak occurs at about five centimeters to the minus one, so about two millimeter wavelength. The background radiation looks like this. This is a picture of the sky, uh, a temperature of 2.728 Kelvin and highly uniform. This was published by Smutadown 1994 as one of their key results. Of course, this particular result is utterly fake because the DMR measured only differences in brightness, not absolute brightnesses. So they made this picture by adding a signal corresponding to 2.728 Kelvin to their differential signal, just to show that the brightness fluctuations are tiny compared with the mean signal. But the mean signal is very uniform. How uniform is shown when you take that uniformity off. And now when you subtract a 2.7 to 8 Kelvin uniform black body, you start to see some structure. Now there are two basic types of structure you can see here. The total scale range is about 3.3 millikelvin, plus or minus. And principally what you see are these red and blue, that is bright and darker patches on the sky, which have a very strong large scale pattern. This is known as the dipole anisotropy. So it looks like a yin yang symbol, which 
I've written out in, in Chinese characters lower down. It corresponds to motion of uh, our galaxy relative to the microwave background radiation by about 400 kilometers per second. Well, 400 kilometers per second for the Earth, 600 kilometers per second for the galaxy, because the Earth and Sun go round the center of the galaxy at about 220 kilometers per second. And the directions happen to add up to give you a, a total of about 400. So our galaxy is moving at about 600 kilometers per second relative to, well, relative to what? It's relative to the average motion of all matter in the universe at the time that radiation and matter decouple. Now on top of that, you can see a little bit of lumpiness along a horizontal line through the center of the diagram. That lumpiness is our galaxy because the orientation of this picture is galactic coordinates, galactic north at the top, galactic south at the bottom, galactic plane across the middle, covering the entire sky. So what you're seeing is that there are certain parts of the galactic plane that are sufficiently bright to appear uh, on this representation, but are still one one thousandth the brightness of the macro background radiation itself, as seen with the antenna of the COBE satellite. That doesn't mean their intrinsic brightness is extremely low. It means that averaged out to the beam size of the COBE beam, the signal is small. We can take that dipole off and see what's left after that, because that will show us the lumpiness. And here we've removed the dipole. You can see the band across the center of the picture, which is the galaxy. Here the scale has been adjusted so that the range is only about 20 microkelvins in brightness temperature terms. And the lumpiness that you see there is, well, it's principally noise. But noise ought to be lumpy on the scale of the Kobe beam, and that is the scale of the smallest features here. But you can see that there are large scale patches which seem to correlate across the sky. That is, there is large scale structure which, though intrinsically has an amplitude only of order the noise, shows up because our eye can average those lumps together. So the lumpiness that Kobe saw is mostly measurement noise on the small scale, but there is large scale and real structure in there. Now, where does that lumpiness come from? <coughs> well, that lumpiness is essentially a test of how structure formed in the universe. Uh, because matter must have started to clump quite early in the history of the universe, and that clumping would have caused the brightness of the background radiation, well, the brightness of the radiation field to change from place to place early on. And then as the universe expanded, that radiation field, initially at about 3000 Kelvin, has redshifted down to about three Kelvin today, but with the same lumpiness in it. Now, lumpiness of the micro background radiation is a huge subject and there have been many, many experiments on it. Kobe provided a first measurement of what was going on. WMAP was largely built to follow up on that, to go to smaller scale structures and Planck to do the same thing to higher precision. And there's a whole host of ground based projects and some new space based projects intending to do even more and better measurements. Now to understand what we're looking at, we need to go into a little bit more detail about how matter and radiation changed in temperature across the history of the universe. And I've put a bit more detail on this diagram. It's like the diagram I showed earlier with redshift on the x-axis on a logarithmic scale 
and temperature on the y-axis on a logarithmic scale. But I've filled in a few more details now. I've still got a line which marks how radiation temperature changes with redshift, the red line, red dashed line, and I've put on how matter, baryonic matter, changes in temperature. I haven't put on how dark matter changes with temperature because I don't know how dark matter interacts with radiation in the very early universe. And the plot here runs from about 10 seconds after the Big Bang until the present day, that is redshift zero, the zero on the x-axis. Now, very early on, the energy density in the universe was dominated by the energy density in the radiation field. Uh, and I've marked that as a radiation dominated phase in the history of the universe. After the expansion of the universe proceeds sufficiently, the density of radiation drops off more quickly than the density of matter and so gradually matter takes over as the source of gravitation. That happens because matter is basically cold stuff and cold lumps, say a lump that is a proton, doesn't change in mass as the universe expands. But a photon, the radiation, does change because its wavelength increases, so its energy decreases, so its equivalent mass decreases. So matter always tends to win out gravitationally in the end, even though it cools off faster than radiation. So there's a time, part of this transition phase, when radiation takes over from matter as dominating the expansion of the universe. A little bit later on, at a somewhat lower redshift, uh, the matter and radiation start to lose contact with one another. As the universe expands, the temperature drops and the hydrogen in the universe stops being ionized. That's the period that we call recombination, but is basically combination since there was never hydrogen in the earlier universe until the atoms formed at recombination. Slightly after that, because matter is starting to go neutral, photons and matter stop talking to one another very strongly. So I've written down that uh, electrons and photon scattering changes from being fast to being slow. These major changes are part of the grand uh, phase change that occurred in the universe about 100,000 years after the Big Bang in round numbers. You'll calculate those numbers a bit more precisely in one of the problems. What I've also drawn on now, though, is the time when the intergalactic matter reionized and the blue line jumps up from a temperature significantly less than one Kelvin to a temperature of some millions of Kelvin where it remains today. So matter in the universe, by and large today, is extremely hot. And it will stay hot because it cools extremely slowly at the very low densities that it has. And the radiation field in the microwave background radiation stopped being influenced strongly by matter at the end of this transition period, that is, at decoupling. So I've said that... Um, early inhomogeneities produce the microwave background structure. So let's just see how matter in the universe would have um, changed with time. A little movie here from high redshift to the present showing how the density field changes with time under the influence of gravity. You can see gravity cause, pulls matter into filaments and then into large lumps, which we call cluster of galaxies. Now, that process you would think would be a runaway process, a sort of an exponential process. It's a gravitational instability, and instabilities 
are usually exponential, exponential in their behaviour. <clears throat> but that's not quite the case. Because the universe is expanding, that exponential behaviour is happening on top of an overall swelling of the universe. And that changes the behaviour from exponential into a power law behaviour. The upshot of that is that to get lumpy matter today, we had to have quite large lumpiness in the universe at the time of decoupling. And the lumps you see in the microwave background radiation are residual lumps from that part of the universe. Now we can see today's structure and we can run large computer calculations to see what the old structure must have been to form today's structure. If you tune that up, there's a very particular pattern of lumpiness and the associated motions of gas in the early universe that go with that lumpiness to form today's structure. And the test of our theory of how structure formed is how well the microwave background radiation structure matches those predictions or retrodictions based on what we see today. Essentially, what we're looking at is self-gravitating sound waves. You'd have been introduced to this thing called the genes mass, which says how uh, what the mass is of some lump of material that is uh, just gravitationally unstable. In cosmology, that genes mass starts by increasing as time goes on. So only uh, very large structures can start to collapse. But the genes mass depends on the temperature of matter and the sound speed. Well, basically the sound speed. And the sound speed before uh, decoupling is basically set by the speed of light. It's a bit less than the speed of light. And that's because it's light that carries information about pressure changes from point to point across the universe. Once matter no longer talks to radiation, the sound speed plummets to the characteristic sound speed of matter at the temperature at decoupling. That's a temperature of 3000 degrees. And the sound speed drops from the speed of light to a speed of some number of kilometers per second, small number of kilometers per second. That means that the lumps that were perfectly happy oscillating sound waves suddenly find themselves unstable and start to collapse. Because there's been different amounts of time for the sound waves to evolve since they were introduced into the universe by initially being unstable. All those sound waves have different amplitudes and different phases by the time decoupling occurs. And so you expect a characteristic pattern of uh, radiation fluctuations on the sky. That pattern can be predicted with extremely high accuracy. There are some co complications to the calculation. The transition doesn't go from very strong coupling to no coupling of radiation and matter instantaneously. There's a transition period. Matter in the universe has multiple components with different ionization structures. Hydrogen and helium become ionized at different temperatures. There's dark matter and neutrinos, as well as baryonic matter, and they affect things. And there's Doppler motions, not just um, static, very slow moving stuff falling in. But essentially what you expect is that the noisiness in the microwave background radiation, the lumpiness, is going to be dominated by the scale of sound waves that can exist in the universe at a redshift of around a thousand where decoupling occurs. 
very round numbers, you'll calculate a more precise number. That sound horizon scale is about 150 megaparsecs. <clears throat> you can calculate the sound horizon scale quite, quite easily. It's just a simple integral. And it's a very weak function of the uh, ratio of baryons to, to photons. Now, COBE was a small satellite, so it could only measure the very largest lumps. It, was getting, it could measure the 150 megaparsec scale chunks. <clears throat> and it showed that this general picture was just about right, but it couldn't follow the <coughs> structure to uh, the scales which really indicate that the uh, structure formation theories are right. This is the pattern of fluctuations you expect as a function of multipole. Now, multipole is uh, essentially 360 degrees divided by L is an angular scale on the sky, or 180 over theta is a multipole number. The peak here is at about an L of 100, well, L of nearly 200 actually, which corresponds to a scale <coughs> of order degrees. Kobe could only measure the range of scales indicated by the grey arrow and so couldn't see this peak and these oscillations which correspond to different numbers of sound waves fitting in the scale of the universe. Later satellites were built to go to larger scale. But of course, you can't get money from a government to build a satellite to do absolutely everything in one go. They want to know that uh, you're getting something useful for less money before they give you something for more money. Now, the locations of those noise peaks measure key cosmological parameters. The basic things they can measure are the flatness of the universe, and that's given by what angle the first peak shows up at. You can measure the fraction of the mass in the universe that's in dark matter relative to baryonic matter by the ratios of the heights of the peaks. And you can test your theory of gravity by the shapes of the peaks. And Kobe could look at the amount of noise, that is the plateau level, to check that about the, amount, the right amount of structure was going to be present, but couldn't measure the shape of the power spectrum. And that needed the larger satellites, WMAP and Planck, which I'll talk about in the next segment. <clears throat>